So time for another 2011 iMac upgrade. This time, we're going after a 21 and a half inch iMac, and we're gonna take it all the way up to Catalina. And there's been improvements since the last video that I did on what kinds of awesome software and hacks are available to make it even more usable. In the prior video, my big complaint was after the upgrade of getting a 765M GPU upgrade into my 27 inch iMac was that there was no brightness control. And on startup, you had no ability to choose your boot options. Both of those are fixed. This machine right now, running Catalina, brightness controls, and if I restart it, I get a boot menu. Now, let's talk through a little bit of in hindsight information. I'm recording this video at the end of this process, which means that I now know so much more than when I first started. The video you're gonna see is actually, of course, you know, me from the past, walking through and making some of these little mistakes. So a few things to note. Throughout the video, I'm going to say the K1100M is what I'm installing. This actually has in it right now a K610M GPU. I'm gonna put up a list of all the different GPUs that are supported with this process. The ones in red are the ones you're going to want to focus in on because they have brightness control as well as the boot menu. These are two things I think are critical for you. Now on top of that, I did have both of these GPUs on hand. The K610M is a $14 GPU. $14. The K1100M was sitting at like $30, but then spiked up to now it's $60 or $70. Not worth it, in my opinion, at this point to keep you know budget within reason. You start to get upper range, $60, $70, $80, and you might as well just start thinking about maybe a MacBook Pro or a, uh, a newer uh, iMac. But the K1100M, I did have one of those, but it showed up dead on arrival. So I wasn't able to get it to work in the machine at all. In fact, I had to record multiple different steps of this video. I was gonna try and use Windows to flash the vBIOS in the card to get it to work. I ended up using Linux. Like, there was a lot that took place in the making of this video. But in the end, 90% of what you're gonna be working on when you do this upgrade is actually software related, not the hardware. The hardware was easy. In fact, the hardware was the simplest part. Waiting for the GPU to show up is the hardest part of doing this hardware modification. As long as you take your time when you turn apart the machine, you're gonna be just fine. So software is where it gets actually quite interesting. There's a lot of different moving parts here, right? I already mentioned Windows or Linux for flashing the video card once it's installed in order to get the boot menu, right? Um, so this video is gonna go through a bit of the software setup. Of course, there's a little bit of hardware work, but honestly, um, that's gonna be the least of your worries when going through this whole modification process. So once again, you know, filming this at the end gives me a lot of that hindsight as 2020 sort of uh, feel here. Um, so let's, let's talk about some of the initial steps, right? Of course, you're gonna to need to buy the right GPU. I'm gonna put a list up. I'm also gonna provide a full set of instructions start to finish of what I went through to get this machine up and running. So this will be a Google Doc, as well as uh, as many of the links to the files and the files themselves on, on where to go and, and grab them. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. All right, so to touch on some failures real quick. First, I thought I was gonna be able to take this video card and put it into an MXM to PCIe extender and just flash it on one of my existing Windows machines. But like I said, the K1100M showed up and it would not even boot. So putting it into the machine and turning it on went nowhere. Uh, once I got it completely torn down, put the K1100M in and then had to backtrack everything. Uh, once I realized it was dead, I went on to my next idea, which was leveraging a Windows VM that I would install TeamViewer on and I would uh, use TeamViewer from my Mac or another machine to actually uh, do a blind boot for my iMac and, and log in then and upgrade the vBIOS. I couldn't get a Windows VM to work for the life of me. Um, there was a lot of partitioning issues and other things around High Sierra that I think have been solved in later releases. Also, my High Sierra installation, it would only let me choose between Windows 7 and Windows 8. Long story short, it became more labor intensive than I wanted for purely trying to get Windows working. And I'm, I like Windows for what it does, but working on a Mac, it just uh, it was disgusting. So now let's transition over into actually getting Linux installed on your Mac, which was way easier. 
hold option on boot up of your Mac and enter into the recovery partition. Now you're going to want to go in and open up terminal and type in csrutil space disable. This is going to turn off your system integrity protection so that you can continue on with this process. So that's step one. Now let's move to step two. Three, install Linux. So I did an 1804 uh, install. I used Belina Etcher within my Mac to make a USB stick that I could then hold option to boot into Linux, install Linux, download NV Flash, and get that on here. Then I confirmed that I could SSH in to this machine, even if the screen's off, and be able to do it by touch rather than sight, holding down option, clicking once to get over to the Linux boot, having it boot into Linux. Basically be able to do all of that with this screen off, all right? Because once the uh, NVIDIA card is in here, who knows if I'll be able to see the screen or not. So I'm able to SSH in, run NV Flash, um, from this machine without even being able to see the screen, okay? Okay, so in the top, you've got your ground slash V-Sync uh, cord here. Just pull that away from the back of the computer and use your fingernail to pop this out right here. Next up, we've got the actual monitor cable. So you can see that it's down in here and there's actually a little metal retaining clip you gotta use your fingernail again, get underneath, right, like this, pop that up. There's a little strap you can grab a hold of to slide the monitor cable out, which is the first time I've opened this sucker up, so it's a little nasty. Um, two more cables. One attached to the power supply over here on the left, uh, and it looks like one more, probably the camera right here, so. In many cases, you can just, once again, get your fingernail along the side of these, pop it on the left and right. There we go. So it came out pretty easy and already fell down. The power supply cable, you just gotta get your fingernail on the top of it, because this is a clip that attached to the top. There we go, that one's disconnected now as well. And there's probably some sticky tape or something included inside that computer that's holding it in place. Yep, there we go, pulled that apart. So now the whole monitor should pop out. There we go, boom, okay. First time I've opened this one up, it's pretty nasty inside. So I'm gonna have to blow it out, clean it up, and start removing the uh, motherboard. Cool. All right, iFixit has a full set of instructions. We're just gonna go ahead and blaze through this one. Um, you know, you may need to undo the power supply to get the motherboard out. Uh, just make sure to maybe take a picture of where all the different cords go. Take a picture of the different screws as you bring them out and put them down, maybe in a pattern that would fit how you would put them back into the machine. Um, and yeah, just, you know, be sort of careful, but firm. There's three screws that hold the heatsink and GPU to the board. Remove those, tear that off. Then you have four more screws to actually remove the GPU from the heatsink itself. Um, should be a fairly straightforward process. I think one of the really cool things was how closely the, the K1100M as well as the K610M resemble the 6750M that was stock. I mean, they're almost a perfect match. So you're not gonna make any modifications to the heatsink. It's gonna be pretty much just plug and play. Now, one thing to note, I'm gonna show this here real quick, uh, remove the back plate from your new GPU because it's gonna have a different screw size. Now I had to use a bunch of different you know, techniques here, but just very slowly press a screwdriver through the opening uh, to push out the back plate that's hopefully glued down for you. All of them I've seen so far have been glued down. Just use a lot of firm force, but then make sure you're not bending the new GPU too much. And you can see I just sort of worked around the board until each corner had popped up and then I grabbed it and ripped it the rest of the way off. Now go ahead and put the old back plate onto your new GPU and you're ready to start the reassembly. Of course, put some thermal paste on the CPU, please. All right, once you have the old backplate on the new GPU, you just go ahead and put a little bit of thermal paste on it, reuse the old thermal compound if you can, and go ahead and put the card back together onto the motherboard. Once again, just look at the iFixit instructions and work through them backwards if you have any questions on which screw to use where. Um, I actually came out of this whole operation with about 10 extra screws. Um, 
So don't worry about it if you missed a couple. Uh, you're not going to be traveling around with this like a laptop anyways, right? Uh, the screen is where I usually skip a couple screws because it doesn't need eight on it. It could use four. All right, got the video card in. And now what I'm gonna do is do a test boot. You can see I don't even have it fully assembled. I wanted to make sure that it actually uh, turned on the second light here uh, before proceeding. Second light being the GPU is actually detected. The K11, oh, well it turned on and then turned off. Um, K1100M didn't even do that. Okay, okay, there we go. So it's on. Now it's gonna throw a bunch of errors because one, no display, two, no memory. Yep, there's the memory warning. So, cool, it looks like the 610 is actually giving me more here. So now I'm gonna put it all together and we'll see if we can get to the boot screen. Oh, I also, uh, let me turn this off so it doesn't get so annoying. Uh, I also got a cable that I could install for the SSD. So I'm gonna put the uh, SATA SSD up here where the DVD drive was so that I have a little bit faster disk access. Um, all right, let's get this thing reassembled. Okay, so I went ahead and I logged into my router, found my IP address, went into terminal, did an SSH to that IP address for my iMac running Linux. Uh, I put in my username and password that I'd set up in my Linux installation. Now, you just go ahead and run NB flash dash six BIOS name and ignore all the errors. It's gonna tell you a bunch of things about mismatches. Just ignore that, continue the flash, and on reboot, so you can type in sudo reboot, you should see the splash screen come up. Okay, let's go ahead and get open core installed. So, what we wanna do is make sure that we've downloaded the open core DMG and that we have a USB drive set up and in the computer. Go ahead and rename this USB drive Open Core. And if you're running on a high Sierra, you can probably just use the disk utility out of the box to restore Open Core to the USB drive. But on later versions, I've always run into troubles with uh, disk utility getting less and less functionality. So I'm gonna actually use Super Duper. Now SuperDuper is a free to download for trial version and the trial is gonna work for everything that we're gonna do here. And what you wanna do is select to copy the Catalina loader, right? So double click on uh, open core. That is going to mount it as a, uh, my, uh, mount it within your file system. So you can actually see here, Catalina loader. Uh, then it'll become selectable here within this list. So I'm gonna go ahead and do a copy the Catalina loader to my disk that I have renamed Open Core, and I want to restore all files. I'm just go ahead and copy now. What it's gonna do is of course, ask you to authenticate, yada yada, copy, and it's going to go ahead and take everything from the Open Core file, put it into the USB stick. Once that has been successfully copied over, go ahead and open up Spotlight again which you can do with uh, command space or select a little search up here and type in startup disk. So once you have selected startup disk and open core is done here, there we go. You can actually see it's starting to show up here. You wanna definitely wait until it's all the way copied over. You're gonna unlock, select this as your startup disk and then hit restart. All right, the DOS dude Catalina Patcher, search for that on Google. Go ahead and download it. It's fairly straightforward, pretty automated. You enter in a disk that's gonna be greater than 16 gigabytes or 16 gigabytes. I use an external uh, SATA disk and then just follow the instructions to create it as a bootable disk. And then when you go to start up your Mac, hold down on option and it will boot into the Catalina installer. Shouldn't have any flaws here. Leave all the defaults through the install process. All right, I've tried to make this easy for you guys. I went ahead and I created a folder of all the text files that are gonna be needed in order to get your brightness working on your machine, especially if you've been uh, using this 2011 iMac. All right, so here's all the files along with the Kext utility within a nice little folder here. Go ahead and Google Drive, right click that, select download. And you can see I've got it here on my desktop. I'm gonna go ahead and open that up. Hide everything else here. There we go open up that folder, and then also unzip the Kext utility. All right, so this is where it's a little bit interesting. 
you should also have open core currently mounted. You've got your brightness control working, right? But go ahead and open up open core, right? It might be in your finder here. Go ahead and find it and open up the hacking tool. All right. Once you've got the hacking tool opened up, you want to actually, no, I don't want to check for updates. I want to actually go to utilities. And then this one right here, this option will go ahead and make a change to your computer that allows these text files to be imported into your computer. So I'm gonna go ahead and authenticate. It's gonna disable Gatekeeper. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. You'll see things sort of flash around a little bit and then we're good to go here. All right, so now what you wanna do, and this one's weird, you wanna do a first run on the Kext utility by right-clicking it and selecting open and then doing this sort of security bypass and say, okay, open, but then once you've authenticated and everything else, just go ahead and Apple Q that. Just kill it. Now you're ready to rock, right? You can actually just drag all these files right here onto the Kext utility, and they will be imported into your Mac operating system. And you can reboot the machine by going into Terminal and selecting to do a sudo reboot. And this will restart your machine with all the Kext files installed, and you'll now have not only, of course, everything we've done before, but you'll have sleep mode fixes for your computer so that it no longer crashes when it goes to sleep. Awesome. Okay, conclusion time. Is it worth it to install the K610M into the 2011 iMac? Yes, absolutely. At $14, this video card is gonna get you on Catalina. And hey, let's just say, it's a couple more years worth of support than High Sierra has. So do this for sure, follow the instructions, make it happen. Now for the more expensive video cards, it becomes a little bit questionable. All of the older Nvidia cards, uh, the ones that are tempting for me, like the K2100M, bit too spendy right now. Uh, I'd like to see those come down $50 price range uh, the K1100M used to be $30, but it shot up to $70. And that's because people are buying them to do exactly this upgrade. And I just don't think that they're worth it at that price range. The, the performance is not there for really what you're getting. Uh, some of the newer Radeon cards can also be got and installed in these machines. Uh, but the lower end model has been reported to not work for some reason in the 2011s. So I'd want to have confirmation that it actually can work in the 2011 iMac before I make uh, any move there. But once again, price, it's $130 for sort of a low performing video card installed into a machine that's still going to require weird software workarounds. So I think that's really the, the true conclusion here. $14 is a no brainer, mm, you know, $30, $40, $50 for some of the more expensive ones. And I could see those as well. Some of the newer cards, let's wait for confirmation. Do the cheaper card now and let's see what OS 10.16 brings to the table. All right, well, hopefully you enjoyed the video and you got everything you need now and definitely check out the Google Doc, the Google Drive file. I'm gonna put that in the description it has all the information you need in order to do this exact same upgrade. Um, yeah, do it, enjoy it. And uh, if you liked this video, subscribe. I'll probably crank one out once every week or two. And if you have any interesting hacks that you'd like to see as well, you know what? Let me know and I'll see what I can make happen. All right. Party on.